Okay, why don't we get started? <laughs> My pleasure today to introduce Dieter Fox. Um, Dieter's the perfect guy to introduce because he needs no introduction. Uh, I think, oh, yeah. I think um, almost everyone in the room knows him in some form or another. Um, he's uh, from the University of Washington, uh, directs the robotics and state estimation lab there, and he's known for a great deal of work in perception and robotic state estimation, this kind of area. Um, although he's talking to us today about some work that I think is a little more tangentially related to state estimation. Yeah. Um, if you don't know him by any other reason, if you've taken my class, you've used his book. No. <laughs> oh, good. Probably so Grabat they know it all. Has been uh, forced on many students here. <laughs> so with that, I'll let you take it away. Yeah, thank you very much, Drew, and, and thanks for inviting me over. It's always great to be back and see all the cool work going on here. I actually did a two-year postdoc here with Sebastian Thrun in 98. It's been a while. Um, yeah, it's, so what I'm talking about is not only tangential to state estimation, but actually tangential to my research background. So this is going to be very risky. And I think Sid, he, when I asked, like, oh, should I, should I talk about that stuff? He said, yeah, it's, it's, he, he said it would be, it's bold. And, and he thought it's also uh, maybe a bit risky. But I, I'm, I'm going to try uh, to talk about that stuff anyway. So in a sense, so typically, uh, when, when you give a talk, you hope at least you have as much knowledge, uh, knowledge as most of the people in the audience. But I'm afraid today I'm going to talk about something about where many people in the audience know much more about it than, than I do. So um, please. Uh, yeah, be nice to me. Um, <laughs> I'll, do, I'll do my best to hide uh, all the things that I don't know. Um, so my first plan was actually to talk about uh, like RGBD depth camera work, because we, we've been working with those uh, for quite a while. Um, but rather than doing that, I'll just give you a, a very brief overview of some of the work we've done with these depth cameras, and then dive into something what we call grounding language in robot control systems. Um, the work is mostly done with uh, Luke Settlemoyer, who is a faculty at UW, um, who joined us uh, one almost two years ago. Um, he's doing uh, research in semantic natural language processing. And the idea of semantic NLP is that, in a sense, you, you, you take a sentence and you pass it into a formal representation in which you can do reasoning. So for example, an application could be uh, a database system, an automatic database system, where you can ask queries like, uh, could imagine me sitting in Seattle and asking, where is the closest Hofbräu house from Seattle? <laughs> and then that answer, of course, is going to be Pittsburgh. And then you ask, well, what are the flight connections? So what the system then has to do is, in a sense, it has to part, pass the words that I'm saying, like the close, uh, next flight uh, to Pittsburgh, and has to map that into some logical representation based on which it can do queries into a database. Okay, and this mapping from the words to the meaning representation to the logic, that is in a sense what the goal of semantic natural language processing is, and that is uh, what Luke Zettelmoyer has been working on for his PhD, and that's what we're starting to work on now, to connect um, this kind of words rather than to a database, connect them to some robot understanding. And the uh, students working on that are Cynthia Matusek, uh, Niklas Fitzgerald, and a postdoc Li Fong Bo, who helped a bit on the perceptual side, because there's some, even here is a little bit of perception involved. Um, but before I go there, just briefly overview of some of the work we've done with the Kinect cameras. Uh, you've all seen that we actually had an advantage um, when I was uh, directing the Intel Research Lab in Seattle that we had access to these cameras a year before most of the other researchers. So we, we had a little bit of a, of a head start. And we've done some work. The, the first one, of course, as a roboticist is to do mapping with those. Um, so uh, we've done some work on uh, building 3D maps with those cameras. Here you can see one. Actually, we did in collaboration with Nick Roy's team at MIT, where we put a Kinect on a quadcopter, and then the um, helicopter flies around, and we can build these 3D maps. Over here, down here, you see a 3D map we can build. It's actually from the Intel Research Lab when it was still in existence. So you went through the same uh, period as we did in, in, in Seattle. Um, and um, the goal was, for example, if you compare to Connect Fusion, here really to do large scale mapping, right? Where in a sense a person walks through the building and you can do then visual odometry and loop closure and get a 3D model out of this. But you can see there's still a huge amount of work that has to be done to get the quality of those maps high, um, up. 
Another key thing you can do, of course, with these depth cameras is much better object recognition. Here's a system we built kind of also for interactive setting where we combine depth and color information to do object recognition. And there's, of course, a lot of cool work going on in that domain here. You can see here on the projection, it's projecting kind of the kind of object it's uh, recognizing it, at, it as. Uh, the nice feature here is that it's not using any kind of SIFT features textured objects, so it works perfectly well with just white balls and, and can recognize those as such. And um, especially work done by Li Fong Bo on kind of learning feature representations based on the depth and the color uh, information. I think what this enables us to do is also, in a sense, build more interactive system. I think a, a key aspect of um, these depth cameras is that they enable non-computer vision people actually to, do, to use cameras and do interactive systems, for example, if you're, dealing, uh, if you're doing research in HCI or in human-robot interaction. Another thing, of course, you can easily do is um, uh, some work like tracking a chessboard. And here's some work we did. A robot that was also in the AAAI, they had a chess challenge at some point. So we built this uh, robot manipulator up there that up there is actually a depth camera. It's looking at the chessboard and has also a little camera actually in the gripper with which it can recognize different pieces. Uh, you can also, it, it's, it's pretty flexible, so you can teach it different kinds of chess sets and different chess boards is working on those. And the good thing is about depth camera, of course, is that it's, it's very, very easy to recognize when the human is doing a move and things like that. So segmenting out the human hand and the human arm is very easy. Oh, if any questions come up, please don't hesitate to ask. And another thing um, in the co context of uh, with human robot, uh, human interaction is an interactive system that we built here. It's, it's called Oasis Kitchen, where let's assume you have a kitchen counter and you have a depth camera looking down and a projector. Then if you can recognize those objects, then you can nicely, in a sense, uh, press a button and have a virtual button interface in your kitchen. And that was work done by James Fogarty, who, who came from here. He's an HCI researcher. Um, and in this case, it was just kind of a shopping list you could do. But in that work, actually, we want to move ahead with this and turn this into a smart cooking assistant, where, in a sense, let's assume there's a recipe and you want to cook based on a certain recipe, rather than you having to go back and forth to the cookbook and, and check out like how much sugar or what ingredients to put next. If the system knows what you're trying to cook and it can keep track of the activities, then it can guide you through the recipe, can remind you when to check out uh, that the meat doesn't get too dark in the oven and things like that. And then next step could then even be rather than just guiding you through a recipe, uh, another level would be that you actually teach it a recipe, which means you're cooking something and you're just describing using speech at the same time what you're doing, then the system should be able to, in a sense, learn the recipe and the amounts and number of ingredients and teach it then to another person. That's actually something we want to do as part of this. We also have an Intel Science and Technology Center, and ours is for pervasive computing. So I'm doing actually pervasive computing. Um, uh, another interactive system we built with this is uh, uh, Lego, where that was uh, displayed at the Consumer Electronics Show, where, of course, you have this kind of augmented reality where the system can recognize, for example, that that is a house, and then it can display a street in front of it, or if you put down your favorite dragon, it can breathe fire. And, <laughs> and that's actually for pure vision. It's not a trivial environment if you look at the lighting conditions, how drastically they change over time. But since most of the features were extracted based on, on the depth information, actually, um, it's pretty robust to that. And now the house was on fire. And, <laughs> and, and, and interestingly, actually, um, they had big trouble publishing that in the HCI community because they mostly said, oh, but these kind of things are already known. And me, as an AI person, I got totally excited about them because there's so much cool research you can do. For example, also in the kitchen setting. I think there's still a lot of work that can be done. Um, but I think the, the key lesson is also that now, with these uh, depth cameras, even though they don't really solve any of the deep, fundamental computer vision and AI problems, but I think they enable us to build systems that are much more robust than what you could do with 
with, let's say, pure RGB-based uh, camera systems, and then enable people who are not experts in vision to do these kind of things. So um, I think we are now kind of getting in an area where we can at least uh, try to look at uh, building such systems that um, is the goal of, of the work that we're, we're starting right now. It's in a sense where we want to build interactive systems that you can interactively teach. Right? So for example, you can imagine if you have a robot and um, th then that robot has certain object recognition capabilities, but there will always be objects that the robot doesn't know or hasn't seen before. So you should be able to just show the robot and say like, hey, that's a water bottle, right? And the robot should then be able the next day to know when I say bring me a water bottle, to know first of all what the word water bottle means and what a water bottle looks like, okay? So we want to build systems that we can teach by demonstrating things to them. And this is all in the context of object recognition, but on the long run also kind of teaching them activities to uh, perform certain procedures. And um, uh, example applications are, of course, I'll, I'll give you another one in the robotics domain, like teachable robots, but also these kind of smart spaces like a smart uh, kitchen, right, where you teach the kitchen in a sense a certain recipe. So you teach it about the ingredients, you teach it about the steps in a task that have to be performed. Okay. Uh, just one example that on the long run we might have in mind in this uh, area is, for example, we have a colleague of mine, Eric Clavins. He uh, is an ex-roboticist who is doing now synthetic biology and who is doing a lot of work in, in a wet lab. And he says actually um, that most of the time that postdocs in, in this area spent on is on pipetting and just test tubing things and uh, that's what they do, just very repetitive tasks. But the problem is that every task is slightly different from the previous one so that you can't just e trivially fully automate that. So the idea would be if we could just have a robot like that PR2, that is Josh Smith robot, and, and we could just te teach it those kind of repetitive tasks but that are always slightly different. For example, you might just show it the test tube and say like, hey, that's a test tube, right? And then you tell it, okay, pick up one of the red test tubes and then let me now show you how to shake it. So in a sense, you just demonstrate to the robot how to shake it, and then the robot should be able via, let's say, imitation learning, inverse optimal control, things like that, should be able, in a sense, to shake it itself. And at the same time, it also needs to learn the word shake it, right? So it's, in a sense, understanding what shake means when I ground it in the real world. And then you would like to be able, of course, to tell it like, OK, now put it back and do the same task for all of those test tubes. Okay, and that is kind of, I think, uh, uh, kind of a longer term vision we have for these robots in these task oriented settings. It could also be just in small factory or on a workbench, or even if you have children playing with a robot, the, the kids should just be able to explain to the robot, okay, this is what I want you to do, or this is my dragon, and the robot should just then learn that that is a dragon. Okay? So what we want to do is, in a sense, something that we might call interactive grounding. And I think there are two key pieces to that, uh, to these uh, systems. So the first one is that the robot needs to be able to take as input the, first of all, language or speech. Okay, it needs to take into account the context the human is in, for example, the gestures, the gaze. And it needs to be able to, in a sense, take that and parse it into a formal representation so that it can reason internally about the world. Okay? And that is, in a sense, the, this semantic parsing, in a sense, but now extended not only for language, but also for, for chase and, uh, gaze and gesture. So, for example, if I say that's a water bottle, that only, the word that only makes sense to the robot if at the same time it considers what I'm pointing at or what I'm looking at. And that's also called like this shared attention. This is uh, very natural how children learn from caregivers. Okay, so on the one hand side, we need to be able to pass all of this information into the formal representation. And then the next step is we need to be able to go from the symbols in the formal representation. So for example, if I say water bottle, it's easy to generate a symbol that represents a water bottle, but you also need to ground that in the perceptual space, which means the robot needs to learn a perceptual model of what a water bottle looks like. Okay, and the same is true if you want to ground actions in robotics, the robot needs to be able to actually execute them and not just um, reason about those. It's interesting that if you talk to people in NLP, for them in a sense the grounding problem is more like the first part. Okay, they just say, if I go from the language to the formal representation, then I'm kind of done with, with, with the hard pieces. And roboticists, of course, care uh, very much about those problems, right, where you say, I have a formal representation and I need to be able to ground it in the real world so that the robot can perceive and act on it. Okay? So today, um, I want to give you uh, 
two examples on this uh, language grounding piece that we've done so far. And again, have in mind this very preliminary work and um, it's very much ongoing work, but it's at least something I am very excited about. So the first application domain is direction following, where we try to enable a robot kind of to follow human, given, human language given directions through a building. And the other one is then uh, some very recent work, on, an ongoing work on grounding object and attributes. And the kind of attributes we have in mind are very simple ones, like even color green, red, blue, or something like that. And shape would be something like a triangle or a circle. There's been a lot of work on grounding language in, in robot control. On the one hand side, a lot of work on just kind of having logic-based representations for controlling a robot. It turns out we actually, when we did these museum tour guide projects in 96 and 98, I think, we actually at the high level system used um, in one actually a prologue-based, uh, logic-based controller for the robot. And uh, Hadas Kraskazid is doing some very exciting work on, in a sense, using these logic-based systems to control robots and reason about uh, what the robots can do. I think the kind of first person who's really looking at this kind of language to direction following for robotics and indoor environments was uh, McMain and, and Ben Kuypers, where they, in a sense, had a simulated environment with very rich features in it and tried to map directions through that environment into a representation that a robot could hopefully then follow. Um, and then, of course, this uh, Tom Collar, uh, together with Stephanie Talex uh, and Nick Roy, especially at MIT, they did some, some very exciting work on, in a sense, where their focus was, I think, I hope I represent it kind of correctly, more on the second part of the po problem, where you say you take the language, you pass it into a representation, and then how do you ground that representation in the world model that the robot has? So it's more like grounding the lang uh, the, 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 the the kind of logical representation in uh, the perceptual space of the robot, such as landmarks and things like that. Um, and our focus is more on learning to go from the language to the logical representation. Um, there's also Ray Mooney at UT Austin did some very exciting work on, in a sense, semantic uh, uh, statistical machine translation, where he tried to par learn to parse, in a sense, RoboCup in the RoboCup Simulation League uh, to, in a sense, map descriptions of the game to an understanding of what's really going on in the game. And more recently, he also moved into this direction following because it seems to be like it's a pretty nice application uh, domain. Um, and, and Luke Zettelmeyer and also uh, Percy Liang are working a lot in this area of what's called semantic parsing in natural language processing. Um, there's a group in, in Germany, actually Gertjan Kreuf, they do a lot of also language grounding in the context of semantic mapping where it's about like um, grounding words in the, in the rooms of an environment, place descriptions and object descriptions. And of course, huge amount of work here at, at CMU going on, right? And my sense is so far a lot of the focus is more on the dialogue speech side of things. Okay, and as you'll see, we, we don't do any speech yet, but we want to do that in the future. Our focus is really more from the language, from the words to the representation. So in a sense, what we want to do by route instruction following is something like if a robot has a map like that, where you have, in a sense, a graph-based structure where you describe rooms and hallways and intersections, um, we would like the robot to be able to take as input a command like leave the room, turn right, take the first left, and so on, and then be able to just execute that and go to the goal location, rather than giving it an exact XY location, just a more natural way of describing path to robot. And it turns out there were some studies that actually humans are pretty bad at both at giving and following directions. Okay, there might be confusion with left, right, and then they leave out certain parts of the commands. Um, so how, how we approach the problem is, first of all, you need, in a sense, a map representation like that. And we started out with an, kind of an occupancy grid. This is kind of your standard generic uh, robot map for, um, that's very nice for laser-based exploration and navigation, and you can now click on a point and it navigates to that location. But what we need to get is more like a semantic representation about rooms and hallways and things like that. So in a sense, what that is is nothing else than a labeling task, right? where in a sense you would like to label all the points in that occupancy grid map by what type of place they belong to. And our approach was, instead of labeling all the points in the free space, we actually first extract a Voronoi graph, which is in a sense a skeleton of the free space. Okay? And now, all we have to do is label the points on the Voronoi graph. And it turns out, once you label those, that induces the labeling of the complete free space. 
and it's a much um, more compact representation of the things that you really care about. Um, to label those, in a sense, you, we, we actually call that Voronoi random fields very catchy name. Um, you just take the Voronoi graph and you take nodes on that graph or points on that graph, sample them, and convert that then into, into a conditional random field, okay, where the connectivity of the CRF comes in a sense from the Voronoi graph. And we also have some of these specific intersection kind of cliques because um, you want to reason about kind of how many neighbors you have in the Voronoi graph and what your neighbors are like. So you might imagine that if there's a node that has three neighbors, then it has to be an intersection. But if you look back at this, then you have many of those kind of things, of course, inside rooms as well. So by looking at these, at these slightly larger cliques, we can do reasoning such as if my three neighbors are hallways, then I should also be a hall, uh, then I should be an intersection. But if my three neighbors are room, then I should be a room too, these kind of things. And you can learn all of that, of course, from label training data. So we labeled some maps and then uh, extracted shape features about the environment and then did um, maximum pseudo likelihood for training and loop EBP for inference. It actually works pretty well. Um, and then once you have a labeling of a graph, so here the color in a sense gives, let's say, the MAP uh, node type, then from that you can easily extract then with the occupancy grid this kind of hybrid kind of a, a topological uh, a, a metric representation of the environment, where in a sense the screen connected components tell you like the individual rooms, things like that. Okay, so we tested that and it worked actually. We just took like four different maps and labeled them manually and then trained on three and tested on the fourth one. And here you see a typical example. It actually works, works very well. So you can see that here you get nicely in a sense the hallway and the room structure out of that. And we also applied it. One map that looked actually pretty different from the training maps is this Intel lab here on the left. And um, what, what's nice about this one is that I think the structure we extract from it is still actually very nicely captures, in a sense, the different hallway pieces in, in that map. And um, the, the good thing is that it was able to do that even though the training maps were mostly these kind of straight hallway kind of maps. OK. Um, any questions about that so far? If not, then. I'll move on to now, let's assume we have one of these maps. And the key question now is how do we move from language, in a sense, in a representation for paths through this map? Okay? So the first approach we did actually, and that uh, Cynthia published that at HRI uh, two years ago, is we just saw that, in a sense, just like machine translation, right? Like you have, you instead of translating from English to German, you translate from English to path language that, in a sense, describes paths through an environment. So, in a sense, we're on the left hand side, you have something like go down the hall and take the second left. You translate it into a description of these paths, this is our target language. And then you have something like go hall, and then these different nodes are the different types of junctions through the map. Okay, and what you then try to learn is, in a sense, by example pairs of, of, of language along with uh, the paths through the topological map, you learn, in a sense, to pass between those. And we used in a, uh, Ray Mooney's technique for doing that. And it worked actually uh, very well. Uh, where, in a sense, for training, we took, in a sense, a total of about 190 steps through such an environment, and then we kind of moved, um, uh, made automatically generated modifications to them so that we have, in a sense, a thousand training routes, routes as, as training data. And then in the testing, we tried on a different map where the robot is given a certain location, is giving a description that was generated by, by a person, so um, not, not simulated in a sense. And then we just checked if the past um, description actually um, guides the robot through the map to the correct location, and we got about 70% accuracy on that. And the paths were actually sometimes pretty long. Um, now, the problem with this representation that we used so far is, in a sense, it's kind of like a propositional representation because you are mapping the language right away into sequences of nodes through a map. Okay, and that has some, some key limitations that I just want to uh, bring up here. So, for example, uh, concepts such as while or counting things like go down the hallway and take the fourth door on the right. Okay, if you want to do that, 
in a sense, in the context that we use so far, then you almost, you, you kind of have to, when you parse, you have to enumerate all possible things you can see until you see the fourth room on the right. Okay, and to learn that concept is extremely difficult because you need, you need huge amounts of training data. So the target representation didn't have any notion of counting or while loops. Actually, while is something that is um, very important. So if I just to say something like, go to the end of the hallway, right? It's something like, move ahead until you can't move anymore, right? So it's kind of while you can move, just go ahead. But if, if you have th such a representation, then you need to, in a sense, anticipate all possible things that can happen until you reach the end, okay? Uh, here's an example for take the second left. Could imagine there are many possible things that you could, you could see and you don't want, in a sense, your parsing to have to generate all those possible things in the world. So one approach uh, that, that we took was if you know the map, then you can, of course, reduce those parses to the kind of things that you would see in the map as you're moving along, okay? So uh, with Luke coming on board, we actually uh, moved in a sense to his system that is grounding into a much more um, capable representation. And instead of grounding in a sense, yeah. So uh, when you're doing the tagging of uh, the points on this graph, why can't you also tag that, uh, those points with many tags saying end of this hallway or end of that hallway? So that if you can detect the end of the hallway, but our um, For that concept, you might be able to do something like if you have an, a very good end of hallway detector. But I think, uh, but, but for example, concepts such as counting and stuff like that are just very hard to express in that context. Okay? If you, and could, if you could tag them you know, extensively with all these. With all possible combinations. You could, in principle, learn something like that, but it's very cumbersome and it's certainly not an efficient use of the data in a sense. So. Maybe after that, hopefully you'll agree that that is a bit more natural in a sense um, as a representation. And here the idea now is instead of uh, in a sense mapping into just pieces in a map, now we try to map into something like a control system that describes what the robot should be doing upon that um, sense. So for example, you could have something like go left to the end of the hall. You could imagine that that would be some control program that you run on the robot so that it executes that. So where you sequentially, you first turn left and then end of the hall is this loop where you say until you either reach the end or there's a room in front of you, keep on moving forward. Okay? Or another example is here, like go to the third junction, take a right, where we're actually uh, uh, mapping into a real first order logic capable representation where we can have counting and things like that. And in that case, the system can then learn, in a sense, uh, the concepts of counting, what it means in this context, and then you could apply it to, of course, arbitrary numbers in, an, in a new environment. Okay, so this is, in a sense, what, what we're doing now. And now I wanna um, also give you an example for how, how we're actually achieving that mapping. The key assumption so far is really that the robot can actually execute those actions and it can do things like um, de de detect whether it can move forward or not. Okay, so we're just mapping into this control language and we assume that the robot is actually uh, able to do this then. So overall the system works like that where we have in a sense again this control language, <coughs> it's ex ex expressed um, the KBS are like a lambda calculus, where in training we give it pairs of natural language instruction and the control program, okay? And then there was a system for learning based on those examples, we're learning a grammar that can parse from natural language to control system. And then we're using that parser later in a real application, when in a sense we're taking the natural language instructions, parse them, and the idea is that the parser doesn't generate, in a sense, the notes in a map, but it, it, it generates more the intent of what the robot should be doing, which is in a sense that robot control program, and then when the robot goes through the real world, it's in a sense grounding it on the fly. Okay? So that system now can be applied, or you can parse into that representation without even having a map in advance. Okay? So how do we do this grounding? And this is just some brief background on um, that work that, that mostly looked at is, um, so we're using these categorical combinatory grammar CCGs. How many people know CCGs? Oh, nice, a subset, that's good. 
Um, so the idea is that it's, it's, it's a kind of a parsing system that captures both the syntax and the semantic of language, okay? Where syntax is more like noun phrase, um, noun and verb phrase and things like that. And the semantics is more the first order logic representation of the different words. Um, and the idea is then that we parse sentences into lambda calculus. Okay, um, uh, the grammar consists of two key pieces. One are lexical entries. So a lexical entry consists of, in red, are the words. Okay, it could be a single word or multiple words, a chunk of words. Then in green, this is in a sense the semantic structure of the sentence that it belongs to. And on the right side, in a sense, the lambda calculus expression that it represents. Okay, so go to would be in a sense this function that moves to a certain location. Uh, another thing is during parsing there are these combinatory rules that tell you how you in a sense generate your parse tree when you want to parse a certain sentence. And there are rules like this that say if there's a semantic uh, syntactic type x y then you ex and you get a y on the right, then that tells you that you can combine that in something with a syntactic type x and you apply in a sense the function f to g. Um, I'll just give you an example for what that means. But in a sense, these together define, in a sense, the possible ways of um, things, uh, of, of how you can parse input sentences. Let me just give you an example of such a parse. So we have a sentence up there that says, go to the second junction and go left. And underneath are then the syntactic types and the lambda calculus expressions. So you can see if you go to the and go left, then the syntactic tells us that we can actually combine these. And the turn left gets plugged into the lambda f here as a function. And then we combine that into the lambda expression that says do sequentially g. And then the turn left would come from, which comes from right. Um, we can do the same here. In a sense, again, the syntax tells us what we can combine and how we can combine it. And then the, the semantics gives us, in a sense, just functions, function applications to each other. And you can then keep on doing this and in the end you pass the whole sentence and you get out on the semantic side you get in a sense the control program. So in a sense passing the sentence assembles for you the control program. Okay. Now one problem is of course that um, there's always noise in and everywhere, so we have, of course, probabilistic CCGs. And the idea now is that in addition to such a lexicon that has uh, these lexical items, we also have some parameters. And in a sense, in this case, it's just like, let's say, a, a, your typical log linear model, like a conditional random field, where now we have a log linear model over parses that you generate. Okay, So in a sense, where the probability of a parse and the logical form at the end, given a sentence and these parameters, is just, in a sense, this log linear model over the features. Okay, and the features typically count things like which lexical entries to it did you use, which combination rules did you use on the lambda calculus, and also you, uh, you can have, I think, some features on kind of the, the logical expression that you're generating. Um, and the parsing is actually can be done very efficiently. Um, people, again, in NLP speech know much more about this, but in a sense you're building up this, this sp uh, these spans about like looking at spans of different lengths by analyzing your sentence, and you're, you're building up this parse chart. Okay, so in a sense you can very efficiently, in a sense, parse a sentence, and you get also you can also generate the k best um, parses. Now that we have these probabilistic CCGs, the next question is how can we learn them? from examples, and that is work especially that Luke did uh, during his uh, PhD. And the idea here is uh, that the input is, again, is just a pairs of examples of a sentence with a logical form. And what you would like to generate is a PCCG lexicon, like these lexical entries with the weights. And there are two pieces to that. One is, in a sense, the structure learning part, where they have a set of heuristics that tell you what kind of lexical items you can generate. There are different ways for doing that. Um, Kwiatkowski did it, in a sense, by unification on the logical formula. And then given the structure, then the parameter estimation is just, in a sense, more or less a standard parameter estimation over it's log linear models where you combine, in a sense, uh, compare expected feature counts to the feature counts um, here, given, given the labels, and that is without the labels. Okay? And um, yeah, Luke, uh, they also put a lot of effort into how to, update, uh, how to update the lexicon and how to interleave, in a sense, generating or enhancing the lexicon and relearning the weights. 
So now if you apply that to this route instruction, um, we generated a new data set where it also contained a lot of like while loops and, and counting. Yeah. Oh, yeah, oh, oh, thank you. The key aspect of that learning is actually that you're learning solely based on the sentences paired with logical form. You're not giving the parse trees or anything like that. So the structure search has to go over the parse trees, and these are latent. Yeah. Great point. Yeah, so you don't want to have to go through the process of labeling all, the, of generating all the parse trees. Or that. These are all kind of generated then in the learning part. Yeah. Um, but just so that I can also move on uh, to the next part, but in a sense, we're getting uh, very nice results on long instructions. I'll just give you one example on the next slide. We're getting 62.5%, um, but it's also just because it's pretty long sequence of actions and it's pretty easy for the robot to confuse um, some words. So for example, here's one pretty long instruction and in a sense we are we're passing in a sense individual chunks that are separated by this comma and you have then these kind of things this is an, in a sense a pass of, of an unseen uh, command that is really kind of test data right and then go past two junctions and turn right and then it you know, like, like they do sequentially and it, the counting is part of that or another interesting piece here is this one go straight through the second junction, then go left. So in a sense, the past discovered that this then go left, in a sense, has to be mapped into a do sequentially and do those different pieces, like on the left and right of that. Okay, All of this is, in a sense, then discovered from the training data by the system. Yeah. Um, what can go wrong is, of course, things like um, this one here, where the intuit is like, go to the first junction and turn right, then go down this hallway on your left. You know what? Even I would have trouble parsing that sentence because since what the person meant is like exit that room, turn right, and then go until you see a hallway on the left. Okay? And our system, in a sense, passed that into something, um, something like this, where this um, go down this hallway, the system thought w what you mean is kind of you are already in a hallway. Right, whereas the person actually meant like go to the end and then go to the hallway. So it's just some of this typical confusion. I think even humans would have trouble sometimes. And often also if there are words that are totally unknown, then the system also cannot generate um, a, a good parse. So now let me um, move on to this uh, more recent work also, where in a sense we want to go to not just parsing from language um, into a given let's say logical representation, but we also would like to learn hopefully some new concepts on the meaning representation in the logical side of things. Yeah. It's a good question actually from the previous section. Yeah. So how, uh, what's the sensitivity to the speaker? Oh. No speech involved. It's language. No, I mean like the directions oh. that were given. If, like different people give directions in the training. Oh. Which is and we, we we had uh, overall like 10 volunteers and we just mixed those up so it's not like we tested on the same people than we trained on. Thanks. Um, so the idea is, and you'll see it's not as nice as what I show you on this example, but in a sense we would like the robot to learn or the system to learn some new concepts. Okay? And in this case we would like it to learn maybe some, some simple attributes like the color green, blue, red, or some certain shapes. And what you need to do is, in a sense, you need to, if you want to do this, you need to learn the perception model and you learn the language model, in a sense. You need to learn the new words for those attributes. Okay? Let me just give you some examples of what I have in mind. So this is what we did. We went to the Mechanical Turk, put up such a such system and showed them, for example, such a short video. And then ask them if you were a parent explaining that to a child, how would you describe these objects? And then the people on Mechanical Turk would say something like, all of these are yellow toys. Okay? And then we um, would go and write down the lambda expression for that. Okay? The, meaning, the logical meaning representation, which means object of the color X. And that, in a sense, is an identifier for what classifier should be called to identify those objects. Okay? You know, in advance, the yellow is a color? Uh, no, it w I'll, I'll give you more, more details on, on, on that part. Um, here's another one with blue objects. Um, you might have example, this one's an orange ball. 
And in that case, we would even then interpret that orange ball is there's the color orange, and the shape of the ball is labeled in this example. Okay? But again, if we want to train that, we do not tell the system how to do the parsing, actually. Okay? So we have, in a sense, triplets in this case. We have a scene of objects along with the subset of objects that someone is referring to. We have the sentence, and we have the logical expression. So there's also examples like this, green and yellow objects. So there could be conjunction, disjunction of attributes and things like that. Okay? So how we do this, and well, I'm not totally running out of time yet, but I um, uh, move a bit forward here, is in a sense what you want to have is kind of a joint model for the perceptual space and for the language space. Right? Rather than learning those totally independently, like the attributes and the classifiers themselves, we want to model that as a joint system. And in a sense, what we have then here is, again, we have an input scene with objects, and then we have a sentence. And what should happen is something like where we do the semantic parsing, just like we did with this robot direction following stuff. And then we have attribute classifiers. Right? Ultimately, once they are trained, let's say based on certain shapes or colors, and let's assume the system doesn't even know what's a shape or what's a color. Yeah? And then what has to happen is we have to take those together and generate from them, in a sense, based on the classifiers, we have to generate then the objects that are being referred to in that scene, in that sentence. Yeah? And the interesting piece here, and that's what, what Scott was also referring to, what's important here is that, for example, blue in the logical expression has to be mapped to the blue classifier here. Okay? And we train our system in two phases, and I'll explain that a bit later. When the first phase we give it those associations, but in the second phase we don't give it that association at all. And we build, in a sense, a joint probabilistic model where, in a sense, on the input side, we have a sentence x and a set of objects. And what we try to reason about is the probability over the logical expression that goes with it, the classifier assignment, like true, false to those different classifiers, given, given the classifiers we trained, right? And then the grounded set. Okay? And you can, in a sense, um, split this into, for example, there's a parsing model, then there's a vision model that says what are the classifier outputs, in a sense, um, given, given the, the visual data that we have. And finally, this is, in a sense, then connected. The vision model and the parsing model is connected through this, where this, in a sense, says, for example, if the equation says color blue, then the grounding should actually select the objects for which the glue, blue classifier says yes. Right? And you get then probabilities for those, and that gives you your overall probability for your assignment then. So now how do we do the learning of this? So in a sense, we want to learn both in a sense of perceptual side and, and by descriptive speech, of course, I mean descriptive language. Okay? So we have two phases. Um, in the first one, we give the system as training data, we give it um, the, the scene and the objects, we give it the language, and we give it the logical um, representation. And the logical representation also, in a sense, when there's a classifier involved, points to a certain classifier. Okay, so if it says blue, then we, we have classifiers that have more color features and others that have more shape features. So if it's blue, then it's pointing to a specific, let's say, blue uh, classifier. In that phase, actually, the learning is rather simple because, in a sense, you can learn those independently. Where on the one hand side, you learn the parser exactly the same way we did for the direction following. And on the perceptual side, you just learn those uh, attribute classifier, like gr blue, green, and yellow. So the idea is after this initialization phase, let's say the robot um, knows some of the attributes. OK, let's say <coughs> blue and green. And then we have a teaching phase that is a more interesting phase where all we give to the system is um, an image with the objects that are being selected and a sentence. But we do not give the system the ground truth, um, even the ground truth uh, logical expression. So in a sense, now the new sentence might contain a new attribute, such as this is yellow. The system then has never seen the word yellow before, so it has to actually figure out what yellow means, and it has to train a classifier on that. 
Okay, and this is in a sense, we learn this by jointly learning the, the, the two models. Let me just give you a, maybe a bit clearer example for how this works. Again, in the initialization phase, we give it the segmentation of the objects and the classification, like positive, negative. We give it the annotation and we tell it this is the classifier you should call, and then the sentence, and then in the end, what we just learn independently are these classifiers. Okay? And later, after that phase, we can then, just like in the direction following, we can understand new descriptions or different scenes, but using classifiers that we've seen so far. In the teaching phase, then, the logical representation is missing. So in a sense, all we're giving it is these are the objects that are being identified, and that is the sentence. And the system now has to learn, in a sense, to connect the words to the classifiers and train the correct classifiers. So in this case, for example, the classifier, the, the color, it doesn't know which classifier to actually call because it doesn't even know the concept yet. Okay? And that is the key idea of this second phase where, in a sense, you could imagine you sit down with a robot and you just, with a bucket of objects, and you say, now teach that robot what yellow and what a square is. And then all you do is, in a sense, you put down those things and then say, those are yellow and that's a square and give it examples and then over time it can learn those concepts. Why, why is it broken up into these two phases and not as a one optimization? In the first phase because it's also learning at the same time, all the, we, we might be moving there, but for now I think it's, it's, it wouldn't really work because it's doing the structure learning for the grammar at the same time. It's starting out with any grammar, right, without any CCG. And at the same time, it has to learn what are the attributes. And, if, and it has to train the attribute classifiers. And doing all of that totally from scratch without any kind of supervision and connection just so far wouldn't work. Yeah. So if I understand you correctly, you, you don't tell the system that yellow is a color? I'll, I'll, I'll answer it here right now. Yes, so in a sense what we do is we say, so why do we need this joint learning? Why not just even in the unsupervised phase uh, do classifier uh, training and the parser learning? The, th the problem is that the language is really, and because let's assume the person is pointing at this and says this is, and then the next word is something that the, the system has never seen before. Right? So then the question is, if you say this is red, the system does not know whether it's a color or whether it's a shape. Okay, it has to determine what it could be. It could even be, um, it could be a shape, right, such as this is round. It could even be a synonym for an existing color. It might have learned orange before, let's say, and now someone else says this is peach. So the system now should learn in a sense that peach is a synonym for orange, which means you should call the same classifier. And finally, it could just be something that's not a real attribute at all. Okay, so this is the kind of confusion the system has to deal with in the unsupervised phase. Okay, so it has to learn the words and connect them with the classifiers. Okay, does that answer your question? Well, that, that was my question. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe you'll answer it now because I don't understand how you can do this. I'm not yet. Yeah, maybe you'll, you'll, you'll see one thing, yeah. So how we evaluate that now is so we generated 142 of these kind of scenes, okay, and, and, and annotated with objects or pointed at them. Um, the scenes include a total of six different color and shape attributes. So colors were like, yeah, red, red, blue, green, these kind of things. Um, then we sent it to the Mechanical Turk and got about 1,000 uh, Mechanical Turk annotations for those. And then we went, of course, for the initialization phase and for testing, then in a sense we uh, wrote down the lambda expressions for those and annotated the classifiers, right? And then we did splits where for three colors and three shapes, we selected scenes that contained three colors and three shapes and took like 300 scene examples along with the annotation to pre-train the model. And then we took about 500, let's say, so scenes that all, each of those contained at least one of three new colors and new shapes. And in those cases, we did not annotate anything about whether it's a color or whether it's a shape or whatever it could be. It could be just a new word that the system just hasn't seen yet. It could, might be not an attribute at all, right? And then we tested on 10% uh, test cases on scenes that contained the new uh, colors and the new shapes and we're getting precision 85% and recall 80% where in a sense precision means um, 
so you get a scene, you give it a sentence, the system then does the inference over this variable of which objects are identified, and then it returns the set of objects that you think based on the sentence are identified in that scene, and position is which of those are actually identified by the person, right? And recall is of the objects that should be identified, how many did it identify? Let me just give you one example. Yeah. So there are two problems here. The first problem is basically the conversion from language to this um, representation, yeah. And the second problem is correspondence. Mm -hmm. That is, if you have a node in a logical representation, it has to be corresponded to a single object somewhere. So did you try to analyze, like, if you were given the logical representation perfectly fine? There was no problem. I mean, no one was writing sentences. Everyone was writing logical representation somehow. How hard is that problem versus how hard is the logical representation problem? So you mean if I would, like in the initialization phase? So in the, in, even in the second phase, of testing phase, people are like writing logical representation, not writing. Uh, the, so basically, logical representation is not normal hidden. It's kind of observ observable as well. Oh, if you mean you would give the logical representations, but not the type of attribute that is but, being? But not tell exactly which, which object is yellow, which object. Because the second problem is the first one is problem. That, even if I'm saying that object. Well, that correspondence problem we actually solved by, so we gave it the correspondence of which is being referred to and which is not. We did not give the correspondence between the attribute word and the classifier so that should be called. So you know which object. Yeah, sorry, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we gave it that scene. The, so the system knew among these objects, with that sentence, these are the objects that are being referred to. But there's still an association problem that says if this word is yellow, then the system needs to, in a sense, learn what yellow is. Is it a synonym for something else? Is it a color? Is it a shape? You're giving multiple instances of yellow. The classifier It should, yes, as it does. That's exactly the idea. But you can't just train those totally separate. You need to take, because the language tells you whether there are attributes in the sentences or whether it's a conjunction of attributes and things like that. So here's just to give you some intuition. This is in the unsupervised phase now, where on the left side we collected some of the words like red, green, blue, thing, cube, that. And up here we see, so we told the system there are three color and three shape attributes, but we didn't give it any of the correspondences. And you can, this gives you, in a sense, in the log linear model, kind of the weights for these associations. So in a sense, up here are the six classifiers. And what we call a null classifier is for those that do not have, that, that don't correspond to a real attribute. Right, because you don't want them to necessarily pick one of the classifiers. And during learning, in a sense, what's going on is in, in, in the CM style learning, in a sense, the different kind of real the words that correspond to attributes, they start picking out individual classifiers, right? And then giving them, in a sense, the high supportive weight where they other ones get a negative weight. So in a sense, it learned that red should be associated with classifier new, one, new zero. And again, as part of this, the classifiers are trained as well. They were initialized with uniform classifier. These, we just do logistic regression on kernel descriptors for that. Okay? And it then learned like this one is picked for the shape cube. And then interesting, like the word that, you can see here is associated with a null classifier because it identified that that's actually not an attribute. Okay? And all of this falls out of this joint learning that we're doing here. Okay? So I'm not going to go into this in the interest of time. There's, of course, yeah, some, some language variation, right? Or like people, these objects are all triangular in shape, and people, the grammar of that the people use, of course, isn't always perfect. So, but these kind of things we can then pass very well. Um, just to give you uh, failure cases, especially if there's not enough training data for a certain concept, it might then generate things like using two shapes, even though it should use a shape and a color. That can happen. Or even on the attribute, cylinders might be confused with rectangles based on the scene. And these are actually confusions that even the people on the Mechanical Turk sometimes made. So it's not always such a clear-cut case. It's not trivial classification, OK? Uh, another one is also, funnily, like people give very interesting annotations for those sentences. Uh, so uh, I, I don't think we would have identified that correctly as the green object over there. Um, but also, again, people sometimes get the colors wrong because that is actually um, not blue, but it's brown, things like that. Um, so let me summarize. 
So first of all, briefly the limitations of this work, especially of the, of the latter work, is um, so for example, when we generate these logic expressions or the control program, there's just no guarantee that that program is actually really valid, that the robot could really execute this. So this is clearly an open question, like how can you take that when you're passing? How can you take consistency of the logical expressions into account? Or you could imagine that rather than passing it to one control program, you could do the K best passes. And then in a sense, a robot would be executing kind of a ranked list of programs. And it could, as it's going in the world, it could refine its estimate which one is actually the right pass. So that these kind of things you can do. Of course, the big next step is adding gesture, gaze, and speech as an input, and not just in a sense the language, but just combining them so that you can do like like that jacket over there and things like that, so that the robot learns to pass it. But still, we want to keep all of this in this nice probabilistic joint framework that we can learn in. And also in the scenes, we want, of course, you go to more complex real world objects. And in something that I haven't mentioned yet at all is also in a sense move this work more teaching the robot activities using for example like Drew Scraper on inverse optimal control inverse reinforcement learning where I think actually speech can help you a lot for these kind of tasks like if you want to do multi-step if you want to teach a robot to do multiple steps of a task then speech is really good to segment the data in time so you might say okay first you do this and the next step you're going to do is over there is that and then the person might actually say now we're done that is a good segmentation for telling the robot that now one step of the activity is performed so i think doing this jointly using speech in real time into account has huge potential for improving all of this and later of course do this with some bayesian estimation so finally i think so especially also in this constraint domain i think perception is really getting to a level where we can reason about objects where we can reason about humans and gestures and uh, based on this, I think we can really start doing this kind of grounded learning and learning to pass into some form of representation. But I think it really takes, takes huge advances in, in, in many different areas that are connected to robotics and AI. And I'm, I'm really excited to, to move in that direction. Thank you very much. I'm still a little unsure about the question that I asked, which is, yeah. I, I think in the second phase of your learning, mm -hmm. you, you were saying that you could show it uh, an object and say, this is yellow, and not tell it the fact that it's a color. Correct. And it would somehow, and it never seen or heard of yellow before. Correct. And somehow it's going to figure out that this is yellow means that I should create a new classifier and, 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 and learn that color. And I don't see how that's possible. The thing is, based on a single um, single um, situation, you might not be able to do it because, let's say, if there's a single yellow square, th if there's a single yellow object in the scene, and that is the single square, and let's say the system also doesn't know what a square is, then the system would be no way to find out if yellow is the shape or the color of that object. So the key is that as you accumulate the demonstrations, then over time, the ones that are consistent, where yellow actually results in a consistent classifier that is able to learn the concept of yellow well and distinguish it from all the others, that is what's coming out of the EM phase. That is what makes it uh, able to detect it. Well, so it's a single scene, you cannot yeah. classify it. Well, the classifiers just follow one another. There are classifiers yeah. that are already trained to recognize what we call colors, or are there classifiers that just use as input RGB and therefore they are color? How do you know? How does the word color get associated with some classifiers? Oh, so we, so yeah, we made it a bit. It's supposed to shape, say. Yeah, so we did the, we, we, we took the, the depth camera, yeah. we, uh, segmentation in this context is. Sure. Doable, right? Uh, and then we did like Lefong's like kernel descriptors, where we had two types of descriptors. One was just extracted based on the color, and the other one was just extracted based on the depth. Okay, so there are two but, kinds of classifiers. Yeah, okay. I think I don't. We, we didn't try it, but I think you might might get away with just using one type of classifier, and it just has to figure it out. So you could even. But, you, but then you wouldn't have that phrase that looks like object dash color in your. No, you wouldn't. Right, it would just be object or something. Yes. Scripture. You could then even, and that's then the question, like wh what's an attribute in this context? Because um, that's a bottle. You could see this as an attribute of this object, right? So the instance or the class could just become a, so in, in, in some sense, uh, you could just phrase all of this in this one framework, but I'm not sure how well it would generalize or how well it would learn these kind of, con because it's just tricky, as you say, learning yellow just yeah. without 
any clear supervision. That's, that's the exciting part about that kind of work, yeah. And we can talk a bit maybe more about it. But it's, but it's really kind of the multiple scene. A single scene, there might just be this confusion and you'll never be able to find it out. Yeah. But that opens up a good research for active search where the robot actually knows what it doesn't know yet and then actively can generate scenes and could ask Mechanical Turk or so like, is that yellow? Right? So you can do active learning and all these kind of things, but we haven't looked at that yet. Yeah? So does it learn more general concepts like color and shape? Um, Those appear in some of the sentences, not all. Uh, it, and where they do, they're correlated with a subset of the features. So we, so what it learns in a sense, it, 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 it correctly learns to associate the shape words with the classifiers that are shape that are designed to become shape classifiers, which means the depth classifiers, yes. And what about the word shape? No, oh well, the higher level concepts. No, that's not in here. No. It could be done though. It's in your data it was there. You're right. We just haven't done that yet, yeah. So then um, we'd be able to say, well, these are the shape classifiers and these are the color classifiers. That would be cool. Next step. No, that's a, that's, a, that's a great idea, yeah. And again, it could also do this active search and active learning with people. Of course, you could also argue that maybe to detect that yellow is a color, you could go on the web and do some associations and stuff like that. But here we wanted to see if we can get and away again, with that. If, uh, if some of the words that came in were conjunction of round and yellow, <laughs> you know, this is a lemon, mm -hmm. uh, or lime, I guess, was your example. Uh, it ought to be able to learn that using roughly the same technique. Yes, you could. That's, that refers a bit to this kind of thing where you say it's a combination of math. But right now, we just learn, in a sense, very explicit mappings for single attributes. But ultimately, yes, you could, could imagine going in that direction. Yeah. So you give the system a lemon, it will, as you say, this is yellow or this is round? That's what we would do right now, in a sense, yeah. Let me take one more question. Is there any more? Well, that's easy. <laughs> okay, thank you.